Yeah, so just to, in the words that you're using, cerebrospinal fluid, it's a fluid that essentially bathes the cerebrum, which is the head, uh, the brain, and the spine. Um, and so not many people are aware that we have a, a, a clear fluid uh, that's in the middle of our brain. It's housed in these cavities in the middle of our brain called ventricles. Um, and it bathes the outside of our brain. Um, and it goes all the way down the, the what's called the central canal of the spinal cord. Uh, so imagine the spinal cord being uh, having a hollow tube uh, all the way down until it ends and it, and it tapers off uh, at the end of the spinal cord. Um, so you have a hollow tube in the middle of your spinal cord, and that's also filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And the cerebrospinal fluid also bathes the outside of your spinal cord. Uh, and there's a pool of cerebrospinal fluid that comes down all the way down to your all the way down to your sacrum. Um, so even though your uh, spine, um, your spinal cord ends at lumbar vertebrae two, um, your cerebrospinal fluid goes actually all the way down to your sacrum. So just kind of keeping that in mind of you know right now when we're sitting, if you're sitting and you're sitting on your sacrum, you're sitting on sort of a fluid. Like a like a like a little fluid lake uh, down at the bottom, uh, and so that's that's essentially what the cerebrospinal fluid is. It's a clear fluid that bathes the inside and outside of our brain, uh, and we have these cavities and this central canal uh, in the middle of our brain and spinal cord that this fluid is bathed in. Now, there's been a lot of interesting research that's come out over the past couple of years that helps maybe point us to what this fluid might be responsible for and how it Im might impact consciousness. And maybe it would be helpful if you could share kind of some of those findings and what has you so interested in studying it? Yeah, so I became interested in, uh, in studying it. So I did my PhD on the cerebrospinal fluid um, and really on the changes of the cerebrospinal fluid in brain development, uh, in, in embryonic uh, development, and then how it changed into uh, adulthood. And when I started the, these studies, there was very little known about the cerebrospinal fluid. We thought that it was essentially a, a buffer. If you could imagine um, a fluid buffer between your brain and your spinal and, 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 your, and your skull, so that if you kind of jolted your head around or got hit, that there was this sort of fluid that was buffering the brain and kind of protecting it. That's kind of what we thought that the cerebrospinal fluid did. Um, we, we knew that it had some um, like hormones and, and, you know, electrolytes in it. So essentially it was providing some sort of fluid nourishment, let's say, to the, to the brain. But we didn't really have a good idea of, um, of, of, of its function. And um, when I was in the lab, Essentially, what we started doing is we started looking at the cerebrospinal fluid, mostly because what I realized is, you know, when we grow tissues uh, in the lab, we're always growing them with fluid around them. So we're adding some sort of medium to provide nutrition, to provide information to the cells or the tissue to either, you know, to develop, to, to stay alive, uh, whatever it might be. And in the lab I was in, uh, they studied a lot of brain development and everybody was focused on the actual brain tissue itself, which is a really important part to study. But since I was, you know, I was going into the lab and I was changing the fluid every, you know, every two, three days or every day. And when I was looking at some of these uh, embryologic structures, what I noticed is that there was actually more fluid than there was cells. And that mm. when we were developing, when, 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 when mammals develop, when we develop, even uh, vertebrates and vertebrates um, that we develop in a in, in in a pool of fluid. We develop in 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 fluid, and when we're really tiny embryos, we ha there's actually more fluid around us than there are cells. Um, and so, to me, that was very interesting. It was sort of like, wow, what is what information is this fluid providing to the cells that is helping guide its survival or development? And that was just the first question is, does this fluid provide any information or is it just sort of like a support network, right? Where it's just so you like, well, we need to grow in fluid. And so therefore we are in fluid. But if you just kind of think about it, right, we are, our, our entire body plan is actually um, 
created and designed in a fluid bed. Like we are bathed in fluid. Our first cells are all bathed in fluid. And as we come out of it, you know, as, 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 as fetuses in our mother's womb or in the amniotic fluid, mm -hmm. uh, as our brain is developed, um, all of the, am the, the amniotic fluid actually becomes the cerebrospinal fluid inside the brain. And all the cells that give rise to our central nervous system are all bathed in this fluid. And so we just simply wanted to ask, you know, what are the what what are the molecules in this fluid, and does it provide any sort of information to the developing brain in terms of instructions? And what we found is that the fluid is very dynamic; it changes day to day, especially in the embryo, as 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 the embryo needs certain nutrients, or or you know, or or the brain is developing in different ways. The fluid is actually able to provide those instructions to the stem cells of our central nervous system that give rise to all the other cells of our brain and spinal cord. So imagine, right, if you were, imagine like the developing brain as, you know, let's just say the coast of California, and you wanted to affect the entire coast of California. Well, well, there's a couple of ways of maybe doing it. Maybe you can take an airplane and, you know, spray something on top or, you could just drop something in, in, in the ocean and let the ocean bathe the coast of California. Mm. And that's kind of what the cerebrospinal fluid does in a way is if something gets into the fluid instantaneously, it has access to all the, all the neural stem cells of the developing brain. And so can provide this information in a very uniform, regulated pattern to the developing brain. And so what we found is that it does change dramatically from day to day in the embryo. Um, that it really changes when you become uh, an adult. You don't need all the uh, essential growth factors that are present in the embryo to help support brain growth. Um, and that a lot of the cells that are still stem cells in the human are actually in, in the adult are actually still making contact with the cerebrospinal fluid. So it provides a niche, a sort of environmental niche that helps cells retain their sort of stem cellness that helps them retain their their ability to differentiate and proliferate into other cells um, but it's also providing uh, guiding cues to, uh, to to brain development uh, if any areas of the brain are injured it can actually help sort of redirect where new neurons are going um, so it has a number of of, of, of various functions one of the biggest functions that was recently discovered um, starting in about 2013 or so was uh, essentially that we thought that the cerebrospinal fluid was housed in these ventricles, right? Just like what I said, it's primarily housed in these ventricles. And we thought that there was a big separation between the ventricles and the brain tissue itself. But imagine that uh, what we found in our analysis was, and I called it, you know, sort of like the liquid crystalline matrix, because what I noticed in the analysis was actually that it had a lot of extracellular matrix proteins. And what the extracellular matrix is, is it's exactly that. It's a matrix uh, that is around the cells that sort of helps um, helps keep all the cells together. And when you look at some of those proteins in the extracellular matrix, um, what we noticed is that a lot of those proteins were actually in the fluid itself. So it was sort of like a, a less differentiated extracellular matrix. So initially we thought, oh, wow, well, there's got to be some sort of communication here between the brain tissue that has all this extracellular matrix fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and so in 2013, what they found was actually that um, that during states of, of, of sleep, and this was first done in rodents and then confirmed in, in, in humans, was that during sleep, there is a pulsing nature of this cerebrospinal fluid that goes uh, from the ventricles actually into the brain tissue itself. And we never, nobody ever thought that that would happen from going actually into the ventricles to the brain tissue itself. And, it, and what, it, what, what it helps do is actually clean the brain tissue throughout that of toxins that build up throughout the day, for instance. And so 
uh, imagine that this was the first time, right, 2013, where somebody showed the importance of sleep. It took us, um, you know, so many years of trying to figure out why is sleep important. We knew it had cognitive effects, like, you know, it was the same as, you know, if you had something like, you know, if you didn't sleep for 36 hours, it was the same as a certain number of alcoholic drinks on impairment of driving and stuff like that. They had done a lot of those studies. But we didn't really understand the importance of sleep. What did it actually do? How did it regenerate? And this was actually one of the first studies that showed that this uh, sleep uh, changes the way that the ventricles house the, the cerebrospinal fluid, sort of open up these gates. People call it the glymphatic system, sort of uh, from, from, from glial cells, type, a type of cells in the brain, sort of similar to the lymphatic system in the whole body. They call it the glymphatic system sort of opens up these these gates or you know channels and 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 cerebrospinal fluid can now flow into the brain tissue and you get this sort of pulsatile flow of cerebrospinal fluid into the brain tissue during sleep and what that does is it actually cleans out the toxins that occur throughout the day and now there's a lot of interest because Clearly, sleep is not the only way that you would be able to clean out these toxins. If you think of sleep maybe as a parasympathetic activity, for instance, you can just hypothesize that there are other states where these, the, these gates or channels open up and you get this sort of clearing um, of, of the brain tissue itself. And in fact, um, people have found other ways um, they've looked at, for instance, you know, ultrasound, uh, like focused ultrasound. So, so energy, uh, adding energy to the cerebrospinal fluid. They looked at um, pulsating uh, uh, lights, like a strobe. Um, they've looked at um, at breathing, um, and 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 saw that this can actually increase the the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid through this lymphatic system. Um, and so this is really interesting, right? Because if if we can get, if, if, imagine this clear sort of fluid in the middle of your spinal cord and in the middle of your brain, um, being able to transport nutrients, being able to transport growth factors, electrolytes, sugar, hormones to the brain, but also used as just like any flow of liquid, um, we want the liquid to be flowing just like a river, right? So this is sort of like the internal river of goodness inside of us. If that river dams up, then we don't get the clearing of the toxins uh, from the brain tissue. And then those toxins build up. And now there's a hypothesis that if those toxins build up, that that actually leads to things like neurodegenerative diseases, dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that. And so what we want to do is we want to try to keep this fluid flowing. And so sleep is important. And, and, and what people are starting to now study is, you know, do, do breathing exercises or, or does any way that we can actually stimulate this fluid to flow, does it actually help reduce cognitive impairment, reduce cognitive uh, decline, and reduce neurodegenerative diseases? So it's quite incredible where we've come over the last 20 years in terms of understanding this fluid. And now it has generated a huge amount of interest in terms of what are the practices that we could do, whether we're young adults or, 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 or elderly, that can actually try to stimulate this fluid, knowing that you have this river within you, that we might have the ability to consciously regulate the flow of this fluid within us through our brain tissues to help us essentially clear any toxins or debris that may have built up throughout the day, just from general use, wear and tear, thinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's sort of like, that's sort of like one of the biggest things to, um, to, 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 to think about and moving forward with the cerebrospinal fluid is what am I doing to help get my fluid flowing such that I can keep my brain and cells clean and, 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 and toxin free. That's essentially what, where, where, where we have come. Thank you for checking out this clip. If you want to see the full episode, you can do so by going up here. I hope you have a wonderful day.